Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Sports. I am Ralph Labella. And I'm Ron Sen. This week it's important to focus on the role of sports in society and the overlap of problems that exist in society and sport. For example, currently there are 55 universities under investigation for failing to investigate sexual assault on campus. And these aren't necessarily big schools, small schools, northern schools, southern schools. They're all across the United States including three Ivy League schools, Harvard, Dartmouth, and Princeton. We know, for example, at Florida State, Heisman Trophy Jameis Winston had an incomplete uh, investigation, was never charged, and now this week you had a minor uh, shoplifting charge, apparently taking some crab legs from a store. Now, I'm not saying taking crab legs is, is a, a huge deal, relative to other issues, but it seems that there's a loss of institutional control happening across the United States. What, they're getting calls from the individuals? Well, what happened? The NCAA, they're, they're calling them? Well, I think it's, it's not all, the, all athletes, of course. It's, it's a problem far bigger than that. And the Obama administration is trying to get a bigger handle on it. There's some talk that as many as f one in five female students is assaulted during her time at college. And we also know that there's a big problem in the military that they're working to solve too. It's just, it's not acceptable in any way, shape or form. And I don't know when America is going to wake up to this and start educating their younger people and older people as to the implications and consequences. Yeah, when you get in schools, I mean, most of the schools, I mean, is they're drinking, I mean, it's a big time. I mean, you just sure. about every school. I would say most of the schools, it's, it's a huge problem. And what happens? You have young kids between 18 and 21 drinking, and they get together, especially on weekends, and, and that's what happens. And, well, uh, and it is a, it's a major problem. And you have a, a, an issue where in big institutions, including schools like Southern Cal, Ohio State, Florida State, where the athletes are recognized, and, and there's an, to an extent, it seems like there's an effort to protect them from investigations and the consequences, because that's quote, bad, unquote, for the university. Well, you know, I talk and people look at me like I'm 80 years old sometimes. In work, I try to tell the girls in work, I said, it's a problem. When you let someone swear in front of you, I'm huge into that, I'm, you know, about not swearing in front of females. And, and, and they accept it. As a matter of fact, I got an argument with a DA one day. I'm saying, you know, you shouldn't be saying, because he says, you know, say the F word in court just because he has to, to explain to the judge what happened. And then I said, you know, but you say it outside of it, too. I said, you know, the girls don't want to hear that. And he goes, no. So he goes up to a couple of girls, and they say they don't mind it. Well, to me, it starts from there. I think the respect factor starts right there. You should not be swearing in front of females, and females shouldn't be swearing amongst themselves. And, I, and I, people look at me. That's where it starts. The respect factor is huge as far as I'm concerned. Well, we get into an issue where we talk about words and actions, and that brings us into the whole sad case of Donald Sterling. And that brings us to opening up a huge can of worms. I looked up where does the expression opening up a can of worms actually really come from? And apparently back in the 50s, fishermen would go to bait shops and literally have a can with worms in it. And once you open the can of worms, they start crawling out and moving everything. And you can't really get the worms back in the can once you open it. Now, the simple answer is Donald Sterling has not necessarily been known as a, an individual of high character, although he's been immensely successful initially as a personal injury attorney, subsequently bought the Clippers in the 19, early 1980s for about $12.5 million. And no matter what happens to him relative to his lifetime suspension from the NBA and not being able to go to a basketball game, he's going to walk away with a billion dollars. So we don't have to cry too hard for, for Donald Sterling. But he said a lot of tasteless, offensive, extremely insensitive and racist things in his privacy of his home. Now, I w wager that most of us have either said or thought things in our home that we would not want to share with the entire community. And the big picture after this is really going to be, as Mark Cuban said, a slippery slope. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you look at it, I think he, um, he's not going to sell his team. 
unless someone gets to him very close to him and says, listen, let's not go through it. I mean, let's, let's not put the NBA through it. Then maybe there's a chance. I would say maybe 2% chance that he, he'll go along with it and sell it. If he fights the NBA, this is going to go on for you. He'll be dead before <laughs> they come to a decision. I mean, there's no way. I mean, when he, he goes to the courts and he, he goes to the appeals court, you know, eventually he'll go to the higher courts. If he's really adamant about keeping the team and saying they're not going to take it from me, but I mean, it's going to be a battle and a half. It's not going to be that easy. Now, the, you know, the black players are saying, you know, they're happy with Silver with his decision, but now three quarters of the owners have to um, vote in, it, in order for him to have to give up the team, and they're going to vote for it. But forget all that. That has nothing to do. And then when they go to the courts, that's when it all starts. He's got the best lawyers in the world. And they're going to be battling back and forth, and it's going to go on for years. Well, first, he's, he's looking at a $2.5 million fine. That'll buy you a lot of legal services. So, and he's got billions of dollars, so it's not as though he can't afford good legal representation. It's just a matter of skunks fighting other skunks. But you know, to run, you know, they've known, they knew he was like this since 84. They knew it, you know, from things, Massimino story and all that. I mean, it's been going on for years. But people say, well, why didn't they do anything before? Well, they really couldn't. They didn't have really have much to go on. They knew if they went to court with him, he'd win. So it would be a waste of time. Now they have something. Well, Bill Simmons wrote at Grantland that they considered Stern and his associates actions along the way, but they viewed him as the likely Al Davis of the NBA. Davis was always a thorn in Pete Rozelle's side. He was always bringing legal actions against the NFL, and by and large, was pretty successful at it. Um, you don't have to be a nice person to make a ton of money. In fact, my guess is that I don't know all the backgrounds from all the owners in the NBA, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of them are a little sleazy. Oh, yeah. The Orlando, well, I, I don't know if he's really that bad yet. The Orlando Magic coach, I mean, owner. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Bad he I don't know. Is. But once you have accumulated a fortune, then, you know, you pretty much you tell people what to do. They don't tell you what to do. But Silva had to do it. I mean, he had to do it. I mean, you really look at it. He had to do it. I mean, you can't have an owner that thinks that way. Did you, see any, did you see any of his press conference? Oh, yeah. Oh, it was very good. Yeah. I mean, he did a, he did a good job. You know, people were happy. But, I mean, I could have stood up there. I would have did the same thing. I mean, God, what, what else are you going to do? Suspend him for a year? I thought he was going to get an indefinite suspension. That is, there wouldn't be any time period attached to it so they could drag it out. No, the players wanted to know that, they, that the um, higher-ups want him out. They want that. That was the number one thing. They want to know that. And when he said that, on top of a lifetime suspension, and on top of the two and a half million, when they heard that he he wants to get together with the owners and he wants them out, you know, and he's going to push for it. That's the big thing. My psychological psychological interpretation of it was that somehow Sterling views himself as an owner in a modern day plantation, and the players are his highly compensated property. And he can say or do what he wants. He would bring play, uh, friends or associates to the locker room and apparently gawk at the, you know, quote, beautiful bodies that the players had. And he'd, he'd been involved in other issues with, with women with, uh, you know, where services were being rendered for money. And he, he basically feels like if you have enough money, you can buy what you want, say what you want, and do what you want. And we'll, we'll see how that works out for him. You know, Ron, if he was younger, he would be perfect to go to speak to people. If he went to counseling, he sat, sat down, you know, with Jesse Jackson, people in, in that grade, and he really talked to them and they and answered questions. And then if he went on a circuit and talked, but he's, two, he's 81 years old, number one, and tell, t talk to people, tell them why he felt that way. Well, you know, I mean, well, I think that could help. But he, again, he's 81, he wouldn't be able to do it. The ultimate person, by my way of thinking, who gets validation off this is Bill Belichick. Because he's the, I don't speak to anybody, I don't say anything, I give, give no useful information, I don't let my coaches and my players say anything. The Patriots players don't say anything offensive, they don't say anything about anything. You know, and then, in the, I think, con like we say, conversation's huge. You know, you have to talk things out. You know, one thing that bothered me years ago was the O.J. Simpson verdict. 
when O.J. Simpson was found not guilty and they showed two colleges, black colleges, all black students, and when the verdict came out, the place went crazy. They were applauding, they were happy. You know, and, and you know, you have, I had a feeling why, because they feel for years that they've been, you know, stuck to and all that and things haven't gone their way most of the time. And that's the way they felt, but they made that a black and, black and white issue. Right. So, I mean, you know, and they were happy, and I'm sitting there saying, you've got to be kidding me. I'm watching this, and I'm saying, this guy, they know he just killed two people, and they're applauding the verdict. But if you, and I'm saying, why don't they get together? I mean, what, you know, but if, again, you don't. Know. If you try to look inside an NBA owner's head, now, first of all, why would you want to own a company that where m most of the star players and 75% of all the players are African-American if you don't want to be around African-Americans. And then at the same time, why do you have an African-American general manager for 22 years, Elgin Baylor, one of the all-time NBA greats, and four African-American coaches, including Doc Rivers? So you're behaving one way and, and speaking another way in private it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, Doc Rivers, to me, is a bull artist, plain and simple. You know, he plays everybody. He plays the Boston fans. He played the owners. He's playing the people now. He's playing his teammates. He's playing the blacks. He's pay he's he plays you. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. He leaves the Celtics knowing that he's going to play for a racist who's going to give him $8 million because he has a better chance of winning the title. He doesn't want to be with a team that's rebuilding. I mean, give me a break. He played for him. He knew the stories out there. And he leaves the Celtics, who have treated him great, because they had to rebuild. He wanted to coach a team that has a chance to win. Paul and those Humphreys, he goes on a team like that. He goes to play with, for Sterling, knowing that he's a racist. So I don't even want to hear from him. I don't well, even want to hear from Doc Rivers. Well, once again, we see that relationships between octogenarians with who multi millions or billions of dollars and young women hardly ever turn out well. Oh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> how, how can you be surprised? Plus, I'm, I'm trying to figure out this woman who's gotten her $1.8 million duplex or Bentley or Ferrari, whatever, 240 grand in spending money, which apparently they're trying to get some of this back, which I don't know how, how exactly these transactions are made in polite society. Is there a, this problem? I doubt there's any contract. There's no verbal contract. The guy's a lawyer. He buys her an apartment for 1.8 million, two Bentleys and a Ferrari and another car. Jewelry, unbelievable. I mean, does he have anybody close to him that advises him and say, what are you doing with this person? I mean, you got to give me a, give me a break. Same thing with Kraft. His well, son's not even talking to him now. Well, I don't know if people know about that story. They don't go, uh, they don't fly in the same plane anymore. Well, as Yogi Berra might say, relationships are always difficult, especially when they involve people. <laughs> well, that's, that's one issue. Now, soon the National Football League draft is coming up, and that should be fascinating. First of all, the Patriots had a lot of players in of all different positions, of course, especially focusing on tight ends, but they're also had the big name quarterbacks, and we talked about that a little bit. Yeah. Now, if, if by some chance Manziel or Teddy Bridgewater dropped all the way down to 29, or, or close enough that the Patriots could even move up a few slots, do you think there's the slightest chance they would be interested in those guys? No, they, they had them in just to get a read on them. You know, you wanted to get to know them. Okay, we're going to be going up against Manziel. We're going to go up against Bridgewater. You know, and, um, you, know, I want to, you, know you want to, you know him. He got in trouble with the stupid, um, Stealing the signs, you know, I mean, and they, I don't even think they, made, they get anything out of that. I mean, how did that help them? And they're going to go yeah. back to their whatever room and check to see what that sign means? I mean, come on. They could change the signs, the other teams. So they got nothing out of it. People thought they might have won a Super Bowl because of it. I mean, that was completely useless, a waste of time. But here, he just wants to get to know the players. If he has to go up against them in a big game, he wants to know how they, what they're thinking. You know, he's, that's the way he is, Belichick. Just wants to get to know them, the top players in the league. So who do you think that their top priority will be? Or will they, if they have a number of players that might be available at, the, at their spot, will they trade down into the second round yeah. looking for another second? Their number one priority, will, 
and they'll go to the Super Bowl if they stay healthy, is to get a tight end who can go downfield and catch the ball and block some. That's the key. To that offense, the way the type of quarterback Brady is, who's not a deep, doesn't throw deep too often, he needs a real good tight end, a tight end who can get open, and he's going to hit, you know, and then he'll have, um, he's got Edelman back. Hopefully, the three, one of those three young receivers from last year will blossom. You know, and, um, and I think that if he gets that tight end. I mean, I don't know what they can count on from Gronkowski right now. Well, you've got to count on him in the playoffs. You've got you to think that he's going to be healthy in the playoffs. So you have Gronkowski, you have another good tight end, and then you have the ends that they have. Well, again, hopefully one of those young guys blossoms, and you don't know who they're going to get in the draft. But, I mean, that's going to be a key. To me, the key is to get another tight end. I don't want to see Milligan going down the field. Well, Mulligan, you know, Mulligan signed with uh, the Steelers, I think. So they don't have to worry about but that. But they got a tight end, the tight end from the Jets they had come in, but they didn't well, sign him. Right. Keller was in. He's caught the most passes against the was, Patriots. He had a bad injury last year. Though. Yeah, he had an ACL, really bad hit. So, so I think another it was an interesting article uh, about the Combine in ESPN magazine, and they talked about all the various testing they do and what – utility it has long term in predicting how good players are. For example, you have the number of times they can bench press 225 pounds. So you'd think that that would predict how effective a linebacker might be or an offensive lineman. But surprisingly enough, in a study done by a, a fellow named Jeff Phillips of the Parthenon Group, which is a famous consulting company, uh, the, the only position that bench pressing predicted success in the NFL was offensive line defensive back so I guess that just means you've got to be big and tough or strong enough to be able to ward off blockers take down um, big receivers and take down those high running backs that get through the line of scrimmage <laughs> and coming so, straight at you full speed but, th but that was kind of shocking and they said for example uh, speed really didn't wasn't that big a factor you know uh, Bill Walsh makes the point, Jerry Rice, Mississippi Valley State and great, as well as the, maybe the greatest uh, receiver ever, ran 4.5940. And Walsh's point was, he wasn't track fast, but he was quick. game fast. Well, quick. Yeah. Quickness is so important, especially for an end. I mean, you go deep, they're going to pretty much stay with you, but you, quickness, you know, give them a deep one way and go the other way quickly. I mean, even in, ba you know, in basketball, we say the same thing. It's not all about speed, it's about quickness. And then again, that's why he was so good and he had great hands. Right. You know, but, um, you know so it's, it's always tough to see how a player's athletic ability is going to translate into football ability. The, the number one case we can all remember was to Bucky Jones, you know, with Bob Kraft and the stopwatch out timing him and all this baloney. But he never really turned into a great safety, but apparently he was a workout warrior and he scored really great at the combine. You know, it, it certainly helps to have athleticism, but in the long run, your game knowledge and your game efficiency is really what matters in almost every sport. It's all about thinking the game, being a step ahead of the other player, understanding the game. I mean, these, these cornerbacks, they know just about every move. The great cornerbacks know every move the ends are going to be making on them. They can pretty oh. much anticipate the cut they're going to make. And that's what makes them, you know, like Reeves, that's why he's so great. Right. Now, and they made the point that the combine statistics probably help predict about 20% of what a, a player was ultimately going to be. Now, they said that this player, Sam, from, uh, where is he from? Is he Missouri? No. Missouri. He, they said he tested really poorly at the combine, bottom 4% of, of athletes there. But they say he plays better than that. So the question is, a guy like Spikes, he, he was slow, but he was pretty effective because he really hit Against the run. Yeah, against, against the, the pass, run. he was completely useless. Well, he he had a, a role. He wasn't he wasn't a, f a three down linebacker. The question is what he's going to be now that he's on the Bills, other than a loudmouth. I hope he <laughs> plays all the time for the Bills when he plays against the Patriots, because Brady will pick him apart over the middle. Who's he going to stay with? Well, let's hope he so. He couldn't stay with me, cutting across <laughs> the middle. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. I saw one thing on the sports today that was really upsetting to me. There, there was a picture of Dow Rivas playing basketball for a Patriots team that is playing charity games. I do not want a $12 million guy coming off ACL surgery playing basketball in the off season. If he wants to shoot free throws, take open jump shots, do, if he wants to hang glide, <laughs> okay, but not basketball, please. It's just awful. They've been doing that for years, you know. I remember when I was a kid watching him in the North End come in and play. Capaletti and all those, Coke Claw, Artie Graham. Yeah, I played in a game over at Winchester as a kid on a, in a, one of those charity games against the Patriots. We had some pretty good athletes on our team. The Patriots had Mel Lunsford and Brian Dowling. Brian Dowling almost killed me. I went in for a layup. He just about took my head <laughs> off. I got a three-point play out of it. You know, he wasn't that tough anyway. But miraculously enough, we beat them because we were, we were just better. We had Mike Lynch, who's oh, a yeah. um, broadcaster on uh, Channel 5 on our team, and some other players like Sandy Milley and other guys from Winchester. It was, it was really fun, but I just don't want Patriots players playing in those games. Um, NBA playoffs. A lot of surprises so far, some bigger, some smaller. The Heat obviously uh, rolled over Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte was their best player, Al Jefferson, was limping around on one leg, and, and they really couldn't put up any opposition. The team that was pretty surprising was Washington just hammered the Bulls. The Bulls didn't have enough offense. They don't have offense. I mean, they're very good defensively. Well, but they didn't have Derrick Rose. And, that hurts. And they, saw, and they traded Dang. Right. You know, I mean, they gave up, so that really hurt them. And um, they just didn't have enough off. You knew they weren't going to be able to beat them because Washington, you know, while leading them, two other good scorers, Azek, whatever his name is, he's a real good shooter. I mean, oh, Aziza. They, Aziza. And then they, are, they had another player who played well for them. But Bradley Wa Beal is Washington good. just had a little too much offense for them, and they just didn't have enough offense. Yeah, they won't be going too far. But no, Noah but had a great series. You watch no, him? Noah's a really I'd good player. I'd love to have him on my team. No, Noah is really underrated. I went to one game this season. Um, the, the, the Bulls happened to be the opposition. Noah had 13 assists. Now, I, I told Ellen, I said, if you went to a 1,000 basketball games, the center, you'll never see him no. get 13 assists again. But he hustles the whole game. I mean, he gives everything he has. He earns his money, let's put it that way. Yeah, he's got a big motor, and he's got ability. He's got a weird shot, but he can make it. You know, but, you know they just didn't have it. You knew they didn't have it. But look who's playing. I mean, look at the East compared to the West. Yeah, the East, the East teams oh, are a joke. Toronto's up now. Tor Toronto leads Brooklyn 3-2. to two. Toronto and Brooklyn against San Antonio or Dallas. You see that kidding? comeback by Brooklyn yesterday? Yeah. Outscored them by 20 points in the fourth period but just came up short. And then you have, uh, gosh, uh, in, in Oklahoma City, they're calling Durant Mr. Unreliable. What do you want from the guy? He's well, doing the best he can. You have Westbrook taking um, 30 shots the, the other day. 30 sh 31 shots. That's why well, Allen's been on um, Durant, but I would just keep going to Durant. Well, we've talked about, you know, that we're not wild about Westbrook shooting so much. I mean, he's a good player. Well, but when he's hitting the shots, he's great, but, you know, 10 for 31 isn't too good. I mean, that killed him in that game, even though Durant wasn't much better. Well, you know, Durant, say what you like. I mean, he's going to be the MVP this season. He's a phenomenal player. He's, he's a good team player. He's not a selfish player. And... I think he usually does the right things and says the right things. He's a great player. They asked, they asked him about the Mr. Unreliable thing today, and he said, you know, I'm sorry, I don't read the papers. I just do the best I can for myself and my team, and, you know, I'm going to go out and play hard, you know, tomorrow. And which, you know, he's, he's a calm guy, and he, he's got an incredible off-season workout like all the star players because they, they put so much into it. <laughs> what happened to Jackson, though? Jackson was playing great midway through the season. He can't hit a shot now. But maybe it's because Westbrook and Durant have taken most of the shots. Try to get Jackson involved. If Jackson gets going, it'll make it easier for those two players. Well, the other thing is you never know whether guys have little hurt. You know, you get a little guy who's got a sore ankle or a slightly bad foot or a hurt wrist or well, you whatever. Always have, you always have Perkins. I mean, that's the biggest joke. Everybody getting upset when the Celtics traded Perkins away. I mean, come on. The guy gets two points a game. 
He gets six rebounds, seven rebounds. He's not in there at the end of the game. He was never in there at the end of the game with the Celtics. Big Baby was. And yeah. they're saying, oh, they lost the championship because <laughs> they traded him away and for Green. And then San Antonio was down to Dallas. Now they're up three to two. I loved the interplay between Shaq and Barkley. You know, and, and Barkley calls uh, Duncan, I think, Mr. Fundamentals because he's so good, even though he's old. And, you know, may, as we said before, maybe he's the greatest foreign-born player in the NBA. Yeah. I mean, outstanding player. I don't, I, I don't know if San Antonio's got enough. Popovich won the Coach of the Year award again. <laughs> I know how we feel about Popovich. I don't know how you give him the Coach of the Year award when he blew this championship for them last year. Completely blew it. And then, let's see. Well, obviously Memphis is ahead of uh, Oklahoma City, 3-2. to two. There was some... There was some talk that Dark Rivers should go. If, if they didn't get rid of Sterling, Dark Rivers should go to Oklahoma City if, if he's going <laughs> to search around for a team to win a championship. I'll tell you one thing. I mean, they don't know Dark Rivers. You just look at what he did. I mean, you know, we talked about it. I mean, well, leaving the Celtics to go play for, I mean, leaving the Celtics to go coach that yeah, team, the Clippers. Well, well, the other big news is that the Lakers, never, never to be outdone by the Clippers, are on the search for a new coach. And... Apparently they are after Kevin Ollie of UConn, the uh, coach that won the uh, NCAA championship the, this year, or Calipari, who finished second. Why is Calipari going to leave? What are they think about? What are they thinking about? Thinking about Calipari, the guy. It's unbelievable how far he's gone. He doesn't know much about basketball. It's unbelievable. He's a salesman. That's what he uh, is. Well, if you get. At high-level basketball, you never win anything unless you got great players. Oh, yeah, and, and he gets and, the great players. Well, he's at Kentucky. Well, he was at Memphis. And he got the Harrison twins to stay. So. Well, they knew they had to stay after what the UConn did to them. Well, yeah. we said, remember in our last show before they did the, before they announced, we said, I said the Harrison quick... brothers should stay because after what um, UConn did to them, yeah. I mean, they're not ready to come out. With Napier and Boatwright, they were really quick. Yeah, and, they, you know, they're they not had... ready to come out. That, that was a good move. They should stay probably till they're seniors. Just keep improving. Well, we'll see how that goes. Now, there was one sad death in the NBA this week. The legendary Dr. Jack Ramsey. Ramsey had an interesting history. He was the seven-time Big Five champion of Philadelphia. And I always have trouble remembering these, but there's Temple, Xavier, Penn, Villanova, and St. Joe's. And uh, Ramsey was a St. Joe's guy all the way. He went to college at St. Joe's. Uh, he was very innovative as far as his defensive, uh, I, I believe he was really a big advocate of the half-court trap. And, he, and I just uh, ordered one of his books uh, the other day called The Coach's Art, which is really supposed to be an outstanding book. He also won an NBA championship, I think in 1977 with the Portland Trailblazers. That, he had Bill Walton on that team. And he, and he probably would have had a good shot to win the next year, except Walton broke his foot toward the end of the year. So Ramsey's going to long be remembered not only for his basketball excellence as a coach, but he was outstanding as a broadcaster, and too. And O'Brien son was a son-in-law, right? Yeah. Yeah, O'Brien was. Yeah, I mean, he was not so knowledgeable. He was great on the, on the NBA games. I mean, you, you knew. Everybody wanted to listen to him because they knew he knew what he was talking about. You know, there's a, there's a, we know there's a lot. I mean, I know some people in the audience may feel that you know, basketball's not that big a deal. It's just you go out there, you run up and down the court, score. In the NBA, the guys who are the great coaches have encyclopedic knowledge about how to coach, strategy, fundamentals. You know, and if you're a coach, the first thing you have to do is get your players to play hard for you. Obviously, you know, they're not going to do that. But how do you do that in the, in the pros? You say, well, either you're here to win a championship or you're here to put up a performance is going to make you a wealthy person for the rest of your life. And I'm going to help you do that. If you can get players to buy into that, whatever it is that you're selling, then you have a, a pretty good chance. Obviously, the Celtics were able to get enough talent with Garnett, Pierce, and Allen with Rondo to, to win one championship and get back to another finals. I mean, you, Stevens had no talent this year. I mean, no. you, you can't blame him for that. Well, you know, like I said, I've said before that if, if your players really respect you and believe in you as a coach, I mean, and you can get so much more out of them. I, we talk about youth sports. You know, let's talk, you talk about the teams we've coached. 
you know, and I, and I sent out an email the other day to our parents and players, and, you know, we saw how it ended last year with our group, you know, how they worked and the competition they played against. We put them up against the best talent in the state, it really was. And when we played Pentucket in the North Andover tournament at the end of the year, Pentucket, we gave them two good games. I would say two competitive games. One game we could have won, second game we were, we were ahead by one at the end of the first half and they ended up beating us at the end, outplaying us. But as a coach and as a player and as a parent, what I looked at, you know, and I sent out an email to them and I'm saying, listen, it, after what, the way it ended up last year and how well we performed against one of the best teams, a Pentucket team that went to the States and lost in triple overtime in the semifinals to Walpole who played in the finals against King Phillips and lost a close game, all those teams we play. But it, here's what it comes down to, Ron, you know, with youth sports. We know how we are. Now, are the, I sent out the email and I stated to the parents, it all comes down to how you people think. You know, we know what we want to do this summer. We know the work we, through our experience, where we can get these girls to be, become one of the top teams in the state. We know it's right there for them. But I, right in the email, I said, it comes down to the players and the parents. How much do you want it? Well, do you want to give the effort and the commitment to become one of the top teams in the state? I, I read an article today. I might have put it up on Twitter. It was from Business Insider. It was from a Fortune 500 CEO. He said, you know, there really are two secrets that you'll find in every person who is extremely successful. And he says, and they're not secrets. First is, they work harder than the other guy. And the second is, they're not satisfied even after that work that they're good enough. They're doing what they can to become better at their skill. So I know exactly what I want to do to try to help our players finish better around the basket, shoot more, shoot better off, off the run. Now, knowing that I can give them those drills doesn't mean they're going to do them outside of practice. You can't just go to practice for an hour and a half a week and get better. But it's not my decision or Ralph's decision as to whether they're going to go home with a parent or a teammate and work that to, a, to the point where they can become really good. And if they do, then they still have to get to a point later in their career that they maintain that work ethic, that desire, that persistence that will help them succeed at the next level. And you need to be inspired to do that. You just don't walk in and most kids aren't going to have that kind of intensity at age 12 or 13 or 14. A few kids have that drive, Hannah Brickley's of the world, you know, who, who are able to, to put that together and carry that forward, forward for years and years and years. They say Durant, when he wakes up in the morning, the first thing he says is, how do I get better today? Do I learn something more? Do I run a new drill? Do I lift weights? What do I do? And it's, a, it's asking a lot of players to do that, but that's the sacrifice you've got to make. Right, and, that, and that's the key. Like what we said, I mean, if, if players really, when you, you figure when you have a travel team and you have kids trying out for travel teams that they love the sport, they're going to do everything they can to make it. And you know through a program that we run, so because a lot of teams, their kids go to AAU and they, the whole team goes, plays an AAU program. Well, most of our kids, they don't play AAU because they go through our program they save so much money by doing it, and they're getting more out of it because what do we see every year? We're not, I'm not just saying this. Our team constantly over the years, 15 years, have improved better than the play teams that, better than the Bill Rickers, better than the Andovers, better than the North Andovers, all those teams where, whose kids go to play AAU in the summertime, and again, most of our kids don't, what happens year after year? Well, you might struggle as fifth graders, but as sixth graders, you, you end up beating the teams, that some of the teams. And by the time you're in the eighth grade, you're beating just about everyone. With our last group, we set a Bill Ricker, but we were, we, were, we were competitive with them. And then in the summertime, before their freshman year, they won that league. I'm not going to keep talking about it. Right. But what I'm saying is, if you're committed, like most of our groups have been, then you're going to improve. And then that's where the fun starts because you know you can play, go up against any team you're going to play. Well, no, and every game's a big game. The hardest part isn't the worst part of being a coach by a factor of about 100 is having tryouts where, you, you know, the kids have a relationship with each other, with the coaching staff, the families, everything. And then you've got other kids who are coming along, maybe moved into the city or 
played on another team somewhere who just got better or they're bigger and faster and tougher, who have a lot of potential and deserve a spot. So then what do you do? You have to uh, you know, cut kids who you know, are great kids, but not quite as advanced at a basketball level. And that's painful. But you know, another thing too, what I recommend, and it kind of really bothers me, you get groups, you group of places, whatever it's hockey, you know, soccer or whatever, basketball, lacrosse, you get kids coming up that have been really committed to youth sports, played with coaches, done really well, you know, and then they're going up to high school. And you would think that the high school coaches would call and say, oh, your group's coming up, I heard they're really strong. What can you tell me about each player? What do you recommend? Not that they're going to use it, but you would think that a coach would be smart enough, right? But they don't, you know, and, and then you get the people, the higher-ups, the athletic directors, they, they don't even care what's going on in, on in middle school. They don't even know. The reason why the hockey team, was, the girls' hockey team was so successful this year, even though Sam is a great coach, and um, their coaches are real good. But that hockey team was really made the tournament because of the five, five eight graders that were on the team that won the state championship this year as eight graders. But you think that, where's the credit go to you? You got five tremendous players coming up to high school, all because of youth sports. You know, the coaching they got in youth sports, the dedication they've made. And you, you know, I don't know what's happening. I know what's happening in basketball that, you know, again, this is the coach's first year. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But you got a great group going up there, a group that was a tremendous defensive team as, in the, as a group. You would think that they would try to get together with the rest of the players, you know, on the varsity team, get together in the summertime, which we've talked about, and try to keep it going. You know, you know how much it stopped with some of the players because well, you, you know we they just don't care enough, Ron. We don't. We say we're passionate about basketball. We talk about basketball. I wager I have more books about basketball in my home than anybody else in Ma in Melrose, unless there's some maybe there's some Killalays somewhere that have as many from from uh, Coach Killalay and and their lineage. Um, my basketball blog on MelroseGirlsBasketball.com, I have almost 1,400 posts of, about basketball. Um, I've written a book about basketball. I spend way too much time thinking about basketball and talking about basketball. You know, so it's not as though we just dropped by and decided to, you know, spout our mouth off about basketball not knowing anything. And we, what we, as a coach, what do you want? You want your players to be successful. It's about them. The game is for the players, and you want the players who've enjoyed success at lower levels consistently. We've never had a losing season. I don't think we'll ever have a losing season because I, I think we're always going to be able to help players improve to the point where they can compete because of the type of, of young players they are and the attitude they have. So we want to see them be successful, and it's painful not to see, see them succeed. Yeah. And then, you know, you, you just look at it. Um, how does um, Brooke Bell and Sidney Doherty's class, how do they win almost 90% of their games playing against the best talent in middle school and then going up to high school and struggling and not having the confidence and not, you know, having the will to play like they did in middle school? Well, I mean, I, mean, I don't know what the athletic director's looking at, well, but it begins with it's the, a shame. You need to have a philosophy, then you need to have a plan, then you need to prepare, you need to coach to the statistics that make a difference. You know, NBA teams didn't send representatives to the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference for the heck of it. They sent it because it makes, helps them win, helps them compete against the best players in the world. So it's not random. Success is a choice. You work it and you succeed. You do something less, you don't succeed. Right, and you know, and, and, I, and I look, you, you know, just to compare coaches and I know Coach Morris, people have been a little upset about the offense sometimes the way it's run. But he doesn't, number one, he's not the offensive coordinator. I think the offensive coordinator does a pretty good job. But I think for them to be top notch, they're getting there. I mean, they've been very consistent. I think, you know, Coach Morris should get more involved with the offensive play calling because how do you let players like Mercer and DeRaphael at times not touch the ball? And I'll throw a whole half. Well, they, they had a great season this year. Almost got to the Super Bowl. Losing a lot of talent this year, though. Tough but they've season. been strong the last four years. We'll be right back.